Welcome to Scene Change, a podcast by the National Federation of the Blind Performing Arts Division. All about equality, opportunity, accessibility, and the arts. Here, you'll learn adaptive techniques from performers in the know. We are changing what it means to be blind, one stage at a time. Thank you for joining us today. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Scene Change. My name is Lizzie Muhammad Park. I am the Vice President of the National Federation of the Blind Performing Arts Division and your host of the show. Today is our back to school episode. It's our very first back to school episode because this is our first time having the show in September. We'll be talking about applying to music schools and the accessibility accommodations once you get there. So we are so fortunate to have three music educators um, in different forms. First, we have the Federation famous, Precious Perez, who is finishing a double bachelor's in music education and performance at the Berklee College of Music in Massachusetts. Ironically enough, we're also joined by her professor, Chi Kim, who teaches assistive music technology in the music therapy department at the Berklee College of Music. And funny enough, he graduated from there as well. We also have Christina Ebersole, who is a violist. She graduated from the Lamont School of Music at the University of Denver, and she is now receiving a certificate there. Welcome to the show, everyone. Now, to kick things off, I want to hear a bit about each of your personal backgrounds. Um, let's start off with Chi. Now, when did you start playing music? Um, and really, where did your journey in music begin? Hi, so thanks for having me. So my music uh like playing with the music and stuff like that. My curiosity started obviously very young. Um, I had my sisters, uh, like a lot of Asian <laughs> people. Uh, my sister went to like piano, uh, private lesson and things like that. And they'll go and come back and play some piano. And I'll, I was like three or four ish and I'll come to piano and like listen to them playing and I'll randomly starting playing melody that they are playing so and my mom's like oh maybe i should send this kid to piano lessons too <laughs> so um that's how i got exposed to you know music early on through you know my uh, sister just playing piano around the house and stuff like that um and then you no know, then i going to you know, more formal training later on. I studied as a classical uh, music. And then when I came to US, I, you know, explored more pop jazz kind of genre. And yeah, from there, I went to a um, small liberal college in LA called Occidental College. Um, that's where I did part of my music degree and then transferred to Berkeley College of Music uh there i finished uh contemporary writing and production and and songwriting i did a dual major there and after that i went to new york university uh did my master in music technology um then i worked for a couple of years uh writing for you know small commercials and documentaries then i got recruited to berkeley back um in 2010 and I'm still there now. <laughs> <laughs> wow. We're definitely going to delve more uh, into that because it's, I'm sure that there's some, uh, some more um, to pull out between three years old, playing on the piano, and then bam, come to the U.S. and going to, did you say Occidental? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Going to Occidental and then Berkeley. There's so much more to unpack within there. Mm -hmm. um, but let's jump over to Christina, and I'd like to hear a bit about uh, your music journey. Well, very similar. You know, I started pretty young. Uh, my mom had a piano in our living room. And of course, we had that living room where it was like, that's where all the fancy stuff goes and people don't actually sit in there. It's just to look at. So we had a piano that she'd had as a child. And 
I remember playing on it and she insisted that I get put in piano lessons, which was fine. That was fine. Um, and I did piano for, you know, 12 years because she was insistent that I was going to be a world famous concert pianist. Um, however, comma, I did not like the piano, so I never practiced the piano. Um, instead, I, I started taking up every instrument I could find. So I played, you know, the flute and band and then I played uh, they needed a tuba player. So I learned how to play tuba and then um, I wanted to be in the jazz band. So I learned how to play the electric bass and this went on and on. I learned about a dozen instruments. Um, and then uh, I knew I really wanted to play a stringed instrument. It was it was just always in my mind that that's what I wanted. And so I went to college and got my associate's degree just in the generals. And uh, I applied to some conservatories and I got really good scholarships, but I still couldn't afford to go. So I kind of had to put my music journey on hold. And I joined the U.S. Army for a couple of years as an Arabic linguist. And then when I got out, I finally had enough money. So I was able to buy my first viola. And I started taking, you know, um, two lessons a week with the one violist that was within two hours of where I lived. And within uh, within a year and a half, I applied and was accepted for my bachelor's degree. I went to Portland State University and I studied with a couple of amazing violists. Um, Joelle Belgique, who's the principal violist of the Oregon Symphony, and Kenji Bunch, who is very well known for many different reasons, um, some of his untraditional ways. And then uh, when I graduated there, I was fortunate enough that um, my teacher, Basil Vendries at Lamont School of Music, really, really wanted me to come. And we had some really good conversations. And he said, if you come here, you will do great things. And so that's where I went. And I went and received my master's. And um, now I'm getting my performance certificate. Wow. OK, so these are two completely different stories, but pair, like very similar, you know. Um, both of you starting out with the piano, one of you loving it, the other one hating it. <laughs> um, and going from there. Now, before we move on, Christina, everyone is going to put this in the comments. I know. Um, how did a blind person get into the army? Do you want to make any comment on that? Because I know that that's, that's just going to be on people's minds for the rest of the interview if we don't address it now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I was not born blind. Um, I was born with strabismus, which is really common. And I had eye surgery when I was three years old and I've worn glasses my entire life. Um, I joined the army in 2010, but in 2012, I started to lose my sight and I was declared legally blind in 2014. And funny story, they don't really let you stay in the military and hold a weapon if you can't see anymore. So it was kind of the end of my time anyway. So um, yeah, I didn't actually lose my sight until later in life. 2014 was when I was declared legally blind. Okay. So, okay. So getting back before I, I jump into, uh, more childhood piano playing. Let's let's jump over to Precious and see if she's ever played the piano as a child. And uh, that's how her music career started. Yeah, so um, I knew that I wanted to be into music when I was about six. Um, I got this karaoke machine um, and I used to record myself kind of like on tape and that kind of thing, just singing and along to the radio and recording. And um, I also, um, kind of ended up doing choir in school and then talent shows and that progressed to songwriting when I was in middle school and then in high school I knew I wanted to do music um, in college so it kind of evolved over a period of time um, I had private lessons in high school with the Handel and Haydn Society and um, also was in their ensemble and that really developed my foundation for um vocal training and all of those kinds of things so yeah it was it's been a progression and I've definitely grown over the years so your music experience was always in vocal performance it sounds like um not necessarily in the instruments but you do play the ukulele so when I did you play, pick up instruments yeah so I play a multitude of instruments um because music ed kind of requires you to know how to get around a lot of different things so um, I started, ukulele is my most comfortable accompanying instrument. And then I play a little bit of piano, guitar, uh, the flute. And then I know my way around, but wouldn't call myself proficient in like clarinet, saxophone, uh, among other things. Um, wow. So a lot of my instruments started in college, um, really just picking it up. I took piano in high school and guitar in high school, but I didn't really start picking all of that up until college. 
Wow. Okay. So all of you with these uh, varied, you know, musical interests and, um, you know, uh, talented abilities. Now, Chi, what was it that you liked about the piano from a young age? And I know you said that you studied classical first and then jazz later. So I'd also like to hear your perspective on different styles of piano playing. Sure. Yeah. So um, I actually, it's a funny story because after like I, my mom decided I should become a like, you know, professional pianist or whatever. I hated it because <laughs> um, I was um, tr- um, taught on the like very strict, typical Asian um, musicians um, that could not tolerate any mistake. <laughs> so um, I hated the uh, um, playing piano in the beginning it was fun, but once I got into more serious, I kind of didn't want to do it. And I fought a lot with my mom, like, I want to do this thing. Um, then I went in, I was more going into like computer kind of thing. Uh, I like, you know, messing up with the computer, take them apart and put them together and um, break them and stuff like that. And then I, you know, got into more music sequencing, um, so I was like very interested in music technology when I was like a middle school. Um, then I came to US and I, uh, one of the music teacher found out I play some piano. So she auditioned me and I was, you no, know, I wasn't good enough to get into the band and kind of thing. And then, you know, I started enjoying playing piano again because uh, I wasn't really, playing classical anymore I was more free to explore and improvise this kind of thing I really liked it so I kind of rekindle my passion for piano there um, and then you know so then I went to Berkeley and I ended up kind of uh, marrying my both passion technology and music together um, so I focusing on both uh, technology and music wow and Christina, you have interests in tech as well, right? Uh, I do. And it kind of became a, a self-serving uh, interest, to be honest. Um, <laughs> part of the reason why I always really loved the viola is because it is as old school as you can get. It's a wooden box that I make lots of noise with. And I appreciate that I don't have to plug anything in because I am admittedly tech challenged. Um, but because of my disability and because of you know the education system and, and just the way things work, um, technology became a must. So I became extremely interested in what kind of technology would help uh, with the music education process and how could I best be served by technology and therefore how can other blind students, blind music students be served with the music technology. So it really kind of you know, became a passion of mine. Now, let's pause right there because we're going to get into that in just a couple of questions. But first, I want to ask Precious about her application process. Um, When she was applying to different schools, um, you know, what was that process like? What's the typical music school application process like? Yeah, so the typical process, um, it really started from a preference list. Like, do you want a big school or a small school? Do you want small classes size, big class size? What Do you want a university versus a conservatory? Because like typically if you're applying to a big university that has a music school within, you also have to do those requirements for liberal arts and all of the other things on top of your music requirements. So did I want something that was strictly music based or otherwise? Um, what were the best for music schools? So kind of narrowing all that list down and um, I ended up applying to, I think it was like eight or nine, 10, somewhere around, like I applied to Ithaca College, I applied to Eastman School of Music, um, Hart School of Music. Um, and then I wasn't actually going to apply to Berkeley, which is a funny thing. Like everybody always was like, oh, you're going to go to Berkeley. And I was like, well, I don't really think I need to. And they were like, well, it's right there. You might as well just try. So I did. Um, and I got rejections from a lot of the schools, except for like the state schools like UMass Lowell and all those different kinds of things. But then I ended up getting into Berkeley um, and I actually had a full ride to um, Gordon College, which also has a really um, good music program. 
but I realized like I really wanted to go to Berkeley because it was more contemporary and it was more along the lines of what I wanted. And so um, I essentially just, I had to get financial aid and appeal for more money and those things like that and ended up getting into Berkeley and being able to get through my entire college career with uh, scholarship support and things like that. Super helpful. Um, but it was definitely a long process and a difficult one. And what about you, Chi, when you were applying to different schools? I know you said that you transferred to Berkeley um, after Occidental, but what, what was the application process like as far as um, music school applications? So after I graduated high school, I def- applied to a different school. Then you know, I chose Occidental. And then from there, I wanted to go to bigger school. Um, then I applied only to Berkeley. Like, you know, then I got accepted. So I, <laughs> that was like, I didn't apply to multiple school uh, after Occidental. Uh, I was like, oh, maybe I can finish Occidental or I might want to go to a different school. But if I want to go to school, I want to Berkeley. Uh, that was like, I had only one choice there. So because I wanted to do more contemporary kind of thing. And Berkeley sounded like perfect choice. Um, and, you know, unlike Precious, you know, I just had one choice <laughs> in my mind. What about you, Christina? Um, what was the application process to music school like for you? So um, I am an untraditional student in, in every way that can be considered. I, you know, I didn't apply to my bachelor's program until after my stint in the army. So I was already a little bit older than everyone. And um, I had started my instrument later. So um, that set me apart. Although I, I never told anyone that until probably about six months ago was when I finally started admitting that to people. Um, and so and then being blind. So it was all very very different for me um for for me personally because I'm a violist and um I'm very much into the classical uh area as opposed to jazz um I focus mostly on professors so who did I want to play for who did I want to teach me um so it didn't really matter as much if it was a conservatory or university especially because I had already gotten my associate's degree so all of my university basic credits were out of the way so I could just focus on the music no matter where I went So um, I applied for my bachelor's degree, like to five or six different schools, if I remember correctly. And um, the very first school I went to the audition, um, I talked with the instructor and I explained a little bit, you know, oh, yeah, I'm I'm blind. And, you know, this is kind of how how things work. And this is how I do my thing. And um, let me play for you. And um, not 12 hours after my audition, I got an email back saying, you know, I just don't think you're teachable. I don't think I can teach you. And uh, maybe you'll make a good hobbyist one day. And so that just kind of took me down at the knees. And I I sat and had my my pity party. And my husband gave me a pep talk and said to prove them wrong. So um, I got accepted to two of the five schools for my bachelor's. And I decided to go to Portland. Um, And the application process was was really accessible. Everything online was really accessible. Sending in the videos was super easy. Um, And then for the master's program, it was really similar. All of the applications are either you do it on the university website or they do it through accepted, which is not as nice, but it still works okay. And you send in your videos. And um, yeah, it was was all pretty smooth going application-wise. So Chi, do you remember having to do an audition for Berkeley? Or was um, that not a part of the process? No, I didn't do audition. I had to send in like CD. Like, ah, oh, yeah, it was I not see. that online time yet. I guess <laughs> they didn't have that set up yet. So I, I have to, you no, know, submit some antiquated co- compact disc. <laughs> I wonder if our listeners even know what that is. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> they know what it is. So I like the juxtaposition between applying to one school, applying to almost 10, and then applying to around about five. You know what I mean? I I like the difference of perspective that we're going to get in this conversation. It'll be, um, you know, a really enriched discussion because of these three different perspectives. It worked out really nicely. Um, So what separates an accessible school from an inaccessible music school? 
for me, in inaccessible versus accessible, a lot of it has to do with what kind of resources did they have. So a lot of my process was looking at the accessibility offices for each school and seeing what they had to offer. Had they had blind students before? What kinds of things um, did they have available? Did they know how to interact? And, you know, it, it, it isn't always a thing of like, do they have these things, but also the attitude. Are they willing to uh, make sure that things are accessible? And make sure that you have what you need, even if it means them having to do something different. Um, so I think as far as like when I look at Berkeley, a huge part of it was that she was there and the lab was there, the assistive technology. I was going to have those classes to teach me how to use everything my peers were using so that I'd be on the equal, equal playing field. So it really is about, you know, the resources and the attitudes of the people working in disabilities and if they have those services available for me, at least that's you know, the experience that I had with it. Mm -hmm. And how about for you, Christina? Um, I 100% agree with Precious that a lot of it is about the attitude. So um, I, <clears throat> excuse me, I uh, did not do as due diligence research as I wish I had. So each school that I went to, I was the first blind music school, uh, first blind music student that they'd experienced, and they had absolutely no idea what to do with me so I became a guinea pig for each school um, but it was the attitude of the disability resource center or the disability services provider that made it accessible so my first school you know I was the first one and we tried a, a bunch of different methods the first year that just didn't work out and we slowly started working into a new program that you know just worked and it was seamless and it's now implemented. So the next student after me will have a easy transition. And then I came to Lamont and I, I again happened to be the first one, but they were super open. And it's it, a lot of it too is about the faculty. If the faculty is willing to, you know, have that attitude of like, what works for you? And let's sit down and have a talk about it. And let's, um, let's figure it out and maybe do things in a non-traditional way. That makes a huge difference. And the Lamont faculty specifically, I, I remember I signed up for a course about um, using analytical sketch with uh, box different preludes and um, his pieces, which is it's, it's a form of uh, music theory that uh, breaks everything down into the most simplest parts. And it was all taught online because this was, you know, this is during COVID time. So things happen. And the teacher emailed me uh, six weeks before, you know, class started. And he was like, hey, let's have a meeting. And I want to find out how I can better help you. And we had a meeting every week just about like what works, what doesn't, what could he do better? And he was really excited about it. And so that excitement and that attitude made it really accessible. And it sounds like what you and Precious are both saying is to connect with the Office of Disabilities and see, you know, how they're reacting, see if they can put you in touch with any of the professors, um, you know, even before maybe before you apply, maybe after you've applied, um, you know, and, and kind of just see who's around. Um, what's your opinion on that, Chi? Were you the first blind student at Berkeley? No, I wasn't. Um, mm -hmm. We had uh, no other blind st students in the past. Um, but I think it really, uh, when it comes down to accessibility, I think attitudes is more important than resources and, uh, you know, other you know, logistics that you need to figure out because you have attitudes, positive attitudes, they can figure out together the resources and um, logistics later. But if you don't have a attitudes in the beginning, you're gonna run into the problem where you can't even figure out, you know, what do I need? Like things like that. So I think uh, having, surveying the, the culture of the school and, you know, attitudes of professors and disability office, I think would be very important. Mm, I totally agree. So Precious, did you disclose uh, your blindness in applying? And um, did you need any accommodations while you were doing auditions? Yeah, so I definitely disclosed um, because a big part of everything for me was just making sure that, you know, they had everything available. And if I needed to do a certain portion of the audition, or if there was an issue with that, I wanted to make sure they knew that. Because a lot of these, you know, some of them we had to drive to, my mom had to drive me to these different places. Um, some of them were like, you know, from out of town. So I had to drive somewhere near me to go audition for them. And they had different requirements. So I remember 
there was one school that I auditioned for and they used a certain sight reading book and that was available in Braille. So I was able to bring that with me and use that for my audition. Um, some of them didn't ask me to do the sight reading portion because of the nature of their tests and not able, you know, their inability to have it ready in Braille and the fact that like, you know, they don't want you to be able to see it ahead of time. So I think it just, it really depended on the difference in the schools and what they required, but I definitely did disclose just to make sure that I didn't have any surprises and also that they didn't have any surprises when I went into the audition. I'm just curious, were you accepted to any of the schools that didn't have you do the sight reading or did they, or do you feel like they may have held that against you? Um, hmm. So I had to do sight reading for the Heart School of Music. I did get an, an acceptance from them. And then Gordon didn't have me do a sight reading portion. Um, I don't feel like any of the other schools that I um, applied to actually had me do it. Um, but I also didn't think it counted against me because Berkeley didn't have me do that either. Okay. Um, they have a thing where it's like, okay, well, you don't have to do this, but like, let's hear how you improvise and let's, you know, hear the songs that you chose to perform. And so those are really the aspects they were looking at. Um, and they just don't have us do that part. Okay, cool. Um, Christina, how about you? It sounds like you disclosed and, um, and if that's wrong, correct me. <laughs> and also what accommodations did you use? Um, during the audition process? So I did disclose to some schools, but then after my really bad experience, I, I stopped disclosing um, and figured that, you know, hopefully they would just take my audition as it was. Um, so I, when I did disclose to the universities, it was um, because of the sight reading portion, because, you know, well, it's just not a thing uh, <laughs> when you can't see it. So um, I, I talked to them, the schools that I did disclose to, and I was like, I cannot sight read due to a disability. Um, is there another thing you would like me to do instead? And most of them were okay with it. They were like, no, no, we'll just, you know, we'll see you at your audition and, you know, maybe we'll have you play a little bit more or, or something like that. So I, I never had an issue with that. Um, but yeah, my, my, current teacher has, you know, we've discussed this because I'm getting ready to apply for my, my, doc, my doctoral programs. And we've discussed back and forth as to whether I should disclose ahead of time or I shouldn't. Um, he's concerned that, you know, I'll be judged ahead of time and more harshly as opposed to my sighted peers. And um, because I've experienced that a couple of times, I do see where he's coming from. However, I feel like if a school is not willing to have the right attitude about it or if a teacher is going to uh, judge you harshly because of an accommodation that you need that you shouldn't be going to that school anyways it doesn't matter if they're the best musician in the world um, that's not the right fit for you so um, I have decided to continue disclosing um, to current institutions that I'm applying to wow um, and she what's your opinion on that did you disclose and I know that your audition was like maybe not in person but um, did you need any accommodations or was that, is that like, you know, is that a, a more time relevant thing? Yeah. Um, I did this close for all my, um, applications and, um, I don't think, you know, I didn't experience any, you know, discrimination because of I disclosed. Um, but I, I definitely can see how other people might feel about it. Um, and, you know, sometimes, you know, we at Berkeley, as an example, we um, disability office and the uh, automation process, they do communicate, but you no know, dis disability office does not disclose anything to automation if someone discloses that they have a disability. But, but so I think you could probably um, do the audition and submit the application without disclosing on the application and saying that I have a disability, but you can certainly contact disability office and disclose to them. And they're, certainly they're not going to share that information to the admission or some other admission process. Mm. That's also really good to, um, for students to keep in mind so that, you know, no matter how they feel, no matter where they fall on the issue, they know that um, they can still do their research without disclosing to admissions if they don't want to. Now, 
how did the assistive tech music class uh, start at Berkeley? You know, we, you know, had a blind students in given year one, maybe two. Uh, but then at certain point, I think it's around 2010, we got like five or four at one time. And uh, they were trying to figure out, okay, well, we got more students than usual. So we need to get things, you know, get things together. So um, I think uh, what ended up happening was to you know, try to contact all the well-known music school, you know, NEC, Juilliard, and so on, and figure out what they are doing, kind of a, doing the survey. And the funny part was like, oh, we don't have any blind student. When we have a blind student, we'll ask you. <laughs> so <laughs> that, did, that tactic didn't work out. <laughs> so they... Um, what well, what they did then they invited all the so-called experts from different fields such as music education special special education um assistive music technology experts and had a you know just honest conversation with the chairs and deans and professors okay so we have this these students and we would like to do better job what's the best way to do this like this is a perspective of professor what we are struggling with and you no know, this is a student's perspective and just throw out there like here are the huddles and whatever and then the panel gave us recommendation based on the um their knowledge and it, what everybody agreed was the technology was a key uh, that technology will help students do things independently and be able to communicate with sighted um, peers and sighted professors. So then they started exploring um, how do we deploy technology? Um, and it's, it's, not that, it's not that hard. You no, know, you just schools just go out and buy technology. The problem was, uh, even if you have those technology and a lot of times no one knows how to use like we okay we we have the technology it's like checkbox you know what i mean like we have the technology but the problem is then how students are going to learn those technology a lot of times those obligation responsibility fall on the students and sometimes some students are very tacky they can do um go out and research themselves and learn those things but you no, know, a lot of times some students are not. And what about those students? So they um, decide to open a uh, you know, little pilot program where we teach students how to use those technology and how it fans out. And that's how I got recruited to Berkeley. Um, we had a program called Five Weeks Program, which is like happens in July and August. And bas it's basically for non-Berkeley um, students to come and experience what Berkeley is like. Um, they're all taught by Berkeley's faculty and they take similar classes um, as college level. So you no, know, they kind of have a mini college experience and that's where we put the assistive music technology component into it. So students can come and learn the technology, but at the same time, experience all other things that other students experience. They're going to the ensemble, playing with the um, other sighted um, students and so on. And uh, you know, it was pretty successful and the students really wanted to have that experience as their regular semester. So we started to incorporating the, the class into the regular, um, Berkeley program, not just summer program. We still have the summer program too, but we also have the this program as part of the Berkeley uh, regular semester as well. So the five week program is for non Berkeley students. Are they in high school? Are they in college? Are they in yeah? Masters? A lot of them are in high school. A lot of them are. are I even saw like 50, 60 year old <laughs> um, huh. who wanted to do music, but they never got you know, got to do their thing. So they come like and experience uh, five weeks um, as their little 
surprise, I guess. <laughs> wow. And so all, it's, yeah, yeah, go ahead. And some of them, you know, realize, oh, this is what I've been missing. And they give up their career and they come to Berkeley as a regular student and they re restart. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. So it's, it's open to anyone pretty much who, yeah. who wants to take yeah. it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. wow. Yeah, I awesome. remember um, I when I was at Berkeley, there was a, um, someone who was chair of economics department in another college. He quit that job and came to Berkeley <laughs> and became a regular student. That's, that's, that's hilarious. <laughs> you might quit your day job. Watch out if you uh, go to this program. So, Precious, did you go to that program by chance? I did. <laughs> <laughs> I had a feeling that you may have. Um, well, tell us about it. Uh, tell us a bit about, you know, what you learned there and, you know, if you were, you know, in high school or, you know, at what point this was. And yeah, let's hear. Absolutely. Yeah. So I was encouraged to go to five week to, you know, start getting a head start, especially since I was going into Berkeley full time in the fall to really get a head start on like learning everything and, and theory and what I could expect um, as far as a schedule went. And so my experience getting in was a little interesting because I had some funding issues with my state agency and different things like that, but I did make it. I think it was the middle of the first week. Um, and I had a couple classes, um, including cheese class, um, I had like an ensemble and I had like a performance lab and then some other thing. <laughs> but it was really cool because it really gave me a sense of what I was going to be getting into. Not fully, um, but to the extent that I needed to know like, okay, I'll be fine. You know, I, I started learning my way around um, the campus, which was really helpful. Um, I started meeting people, uh, people that I would interact with later and, and during my college career and people that I would just meet there. Um, there were a lot of people that were just kind of like, you know, this is my first experience. Um, and I did get to learn a lot. <laughs> Chi, I remember you saying like, hey, if you master this stuff now, it'll save you a lot of money if you test out of these <laughs> courses. <laughs> um, so we had a really fun time just kind of uh, learning, you know, the software. And I think I had some of the best times in the lab. So um, that was a highlight really for me is being able to get introduced to the lab and everything that was offered there um, and, you know, get acclimated as far as all of the technology and everything I would need uh, went. So it was a really positive experience and I do recommend it, um, you know, obviously, Financially, that's a difficult thing because it's not cheap. Um, I was fortunate enough to have the support um, from uh, Mass Commission for the Blind and uh, to be able to attend because otherwise that wouldn't have been a possibility. Um, but it is something worth attending if it's something you're highly considering doing. You mentioned taking cheese class during the five week program. What do you learn? What is assistive music technology? What does that class look like from a student perspective? Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> you learn a lot. Um, so, you know, the five week for me evolved into the semester. And so depending on who was in the class with me, it was, okay, what are we learning? What are your goals? What do you need to work on? And then focusing on all of those things um, together. So, you know, back when I started, we were working on Sibelius, which is a music re writing software um, that was accessible. It's now accessible on Mac, but back then you could only use it on Windows 7 with uh, JAWS script. And so learning how to use that and then Pro Tools. Um, and now a lot of people use Logic. So now it's like evolved into that. But really, it's focused on what are our peers using? And what do we need to know um, to be able to be successful? Um, how to write charts, how to write scores, how to uh, record music and different instruments, voices, uh, what decibels, like a lot of theory and, com and um, you know, production was built into that because by default we had to know like what level is safe for recording a vocal and how much compression do you need and how do you get to these effects in these programs and um, just 
all over the map. Um, throughout my time in cheese class, I learned how to make my website with WordPress because it's really accessible. And Berkeley uses Wix, which is the opposite. So um, it really just ranges. Like uh, what she does is really make sure that you know everybody in the class is learning what they need to learn to be able to be successful. And sometimes that takes a different direction than the next class does. But um, it's honestly one of the main reasons that I uh, thrived at Berkeley. If it weren't for the lab, I honestly don't know <laughs> if I would have made it. So. And is this, is this just a one semester class or is it like as needed? How does it work? You, it, as far as I remember, you can take it as long as you need to. I took it for four semesters. Oh, so. wow. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, I will ask you about that in just a minute. But first, I want to jump over to Christina because you also teach a class about music um, and accessibility, correct? I do. Yeah. Just based on my own experiences and the fact that every school I've gone to, I've, I've been a guinea pig and it's taken at least a quarter to get up and running, if not a full academic year, which, you know, can really make your it can make you suffer if you're you know, falling behind your peers. So uh, my first year of my master's program, um, you're required to take this class at, at most places. Mine was called Intro to Grad Studies for two quarters. And it's uh, you do a research project and you make a research paper. It's just to teach you how to you know, do a bibliography and, and write a paper and research correctly and not use Wikipedia and things like that. So um, we were allowed to write and research absolutely anything. And I wanted to know more about music accessibility because they're just, you know, I, I still didn't know very much. I, you know, I've only been using it for, well, at the time I went in 2019. So that was five years. So I'd only been using it for five years. So I started doing my research and I realized that what's out there in the world for other people to grasp and to read and to um, glean information from is written mostly by sighted individuals, is written um, from a, a totally different perspective. Um, a lot of the discourse did not involve interviews or, or perspectives from people who would use accessible technology. And a lot of the technology that's available now was not available. And there was no pedagogical plan out there for how do you institute this into a university policy or into your studio. So I wrote my paper on that. And then from there, my professor was really, really um, supportive. And he asked if I would create it into a lecture series to give at our Lamont Clo Clo Colloquium. That word is so hard, colloquium. Um, so I presented it to, it was a handful of professors in the music program and a bunch of students that came. And um, from there, I created it into a webinar or an in-person lecture. So I've now given it to 17 different universities across the world, um, Canada and Australia being included. Yay, Canada and Australia. Uh, and basically what they do is they, they sign up or they email me and they're like, we need to know more about how accessibility works for music students. Um, they attend my webinar or my lecture and it, it breaks down what we use. You know, it talks about the dancing dot software. It talks about refreshable braille displays. It talks about the Library of Congress having the largest braille score collection in the country. It talks about um, the use of peer assistance in the classroom or in the orchestra or any other way to use um, for visual uh, descriptions, audio descriptions. It talks about recordings. Um, and then it talks about kinesthetic techniques um, using Alexander technique and body mapping and using more of a hands-on approach and not to be afraid of that and to change our language instead of saying here when you see this instead you say this German six chord built on a flat two or something like that being very specific in our language and then afterwards they get this whole list of readings that they can they can use and um, a whole list of resources and contacts so that they can imply apply this to their own studio or their own um, institution to make it accessible for any music student who wants to come in. So you, your class is more about teaching the teachers and yeah, to break it down and make it really simple. Over, it's a way oversimplify it. <laughs> yeah, because because usually people get stressed out. Um, I just had a conversation with a prospective DMA teacher and she was like, I don't know anything about teaching a blind student. And I was like, it's okay. It's fine. It's not that scary. Like we do most of it ourselves. These are just a few things that you in the school need to know and we can educate you on that. It's not a scary process. We're not, we don't bite. It's not, you know, something that's going to be terrifying and hard. 
Um, yeah, there is some cr- cost prohibitive things involved, but usually there are grants or um, other other funds that help institutions and studios cover that. So um, yeah, it's 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 more about teaching the institutions and teaching the teachers. All those students are welcome if they want to know more about accessibility. And what's the name of the course and how can people get involved with it? Uh, the course is called Accessibility is Not a Four-Letter Word. And you can find out about it um, if you just go to my website. It's um, christinaebersall.com. Um, go into the FAQs and it talks a lot about it. And then all you got to do is um, submit a contact form and tell me if you want to be involved with it or if you if you want to view it or, or participate in it or anything like that. And um, I'm really good about responding. <laughs> <laughs> So, Chi, in your class, um, what what would you like to add to what Precious said earlier as far as what students learn and how long they can take the course? Because it, it seems like Christina's class is about, you know, educating various institutions, but your class is going to be helpful for um, music students who need to know more about software, um, you know, how to use, uh, you know, production software, Logic, Pro Tools, things like that. Um, so what, what else can you tell us about, about your course at Berkeley? Yeah, I think uh, our um, model is more like a support class, uh, as uh, Precious explained. It's not replacing some other classes. It's more of a support where students come and, hey, I learned this thing in um, X class, but I have no idea how to achieve the things that I learned in class. Then we figure out, we explore together. Um, it might not be the exactly the same way we get the goal, but we get to the goal. You know what I mean? That's the important part, right? So the students can take uh, multiple times as much they like. Um, and we just try to unpack what they learn in other classes in a more accessible way. And that, you know, in the beginning, I teach everybody the same thing, you know, Sibelius, uh, Proto, Logic, or, um, but when it goes to, if student takes multiple times, uh, we mostly explore things that students need. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. It almost sounds like our listeners would be the most prepared if they took the Berkeley five-week course. If they, you know, if they didn't end up going to Berkeley, if they wanted to go to a different school, take the Berkeley five-week course and then send their institution to Christina's um, accessibility is not a four-letter word course. And then it seems like they would be, um, you know, really just far better set up for success um, at whatever school they choose to go to. Um, so there's an idea. And I also wanted to ask you, she, uh, you developed a software, right? Um, to work with Pro Tools or to make it more accessible. This is what a, this is a rumor I've heard. Yeah, I mean, it's not a rumor. It's been out for a <laughs> while. So uh, yeah, me and two other people um, together, we developed a um, program called Flow Tool, F-L-O-T-O-L-S. Um, you can read more about it at flowtools.org. And basically what it does, it does not make Pro Tool more accessible or anything, but you know, it makes it more efficient for screen reader users to navigate around Pro Tools. Um, you can use Pro Tool without Flow Tool, definitely. But if you use Flow Tool, it will save you a lot of times because, you know, for example, if you wanna find, you can find out a lot of different information just pressing sh- different shortcuts, and it will tell you exactly what you're looking for. Whereas if you use Pro Tool without Flow Tool, you might navigate around the screen looking for different information. Whereas the Flow Tool lets you find that information with just one shortcut or something similar to that. So you know, a lot of people have been using it, and I got great positive feedback and. You know, I think things like that definitely is necessary. But I think the the trend now, I think, is uh, making every software accessible without any third-party solution. I think that's the ideal, and that's where we are pushing for everybody. And the Sibelius is a great example of where um, Berkeley and Avid got together and 
um, have it develop this accessibility feature into the Sibelius where you don't need any other third party thing. You know, if you use Windows or Mac, as long as you have a screen reader, you can just open it and just start using it. You don't need to install any other, um, other piece of software. So I think that's, I think that's better uh, trend that all the software needs to make their software accessible out of the box. Mm, I totally agree with that. Um, Precious, I'd like to know if you've uh, found any common barriers to music school. And I know that's a really loaded question. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, wow, you just hit me with that. <laughs> yeah, out of nowhere, too. Really yeah, I wasn't change. ready. I wasn't ready. Um, <laughs> so I think that there are a few barriers, and I can speak a lot from the perspective of an education major in a program that's never had a blind education major. Um, there are barriers around, obviously, people's perceptions. Them, you know, the first time I walked in there, they were like, oh, you know, this is a lot of work. Like, do you have somebody that can help you do X, Y, Z? And, you know, that evolved into me having to prove myself as somebody who is capable of being an educator. Um, and somebody who can do the work and do it well. Um, and it's, I think a lot of what happens is if you are not an advocate for yourself and you've never had to be, music school is very daunting because a lot of the time people don't know what you need or don't think they can help you. I've had professors at Berkeley tell me they can't teach me. I've had to switch classes because there was a professor that was like, sorry, can't help you. So things like that, you know, it's exhausting having to be an advocate every day. We're human too. And, you know, it's important to do our best to try and educate people and, you know, do the best we can, but it's exhausting. And so I think the most important thing to take away from those barriers and from these kinds of things is saying like, teaching blind students how to be advocates for themselves because we have to do a lot of that in the world in general but especially going into music and into different fields into different programs um, different institutions you have no idea going into it if they've had a prior experience some of them might and some of them might be well prepared for it but there's also the opposite of that. And even within certain institutions that maybe some parts understand and some parts don't, there's definitely issues around that, um, you know, at Berkeley and at anywhere else. So um, I think really it's a matter of um, lack of understanding, lack of awareness on the part of institutions. Um, and also just you know, they don't realize that there are other softwares out there that can help people. They don't realize that it's actually not that hard. As Christina said, like, it's really not hard. We're not scary. It's not this like big, huge change that people have to make. Um, so I think um, all that to say, really, it's just a matter of um, giving institutions those resources and being advocates you know, going into things, you have to be prepared for that because it's a real thing and it's something that can be very hard to take some days and, you know, it can knock you down. It has knocked me down quite a few times. I've made the joke that I'm going to drop out for years. Whenever I'm like really upset, I'm like, guys, I'm just, I'm done. I'm just going to leave. I'm, I'm over it. It's happening. <laughs> I don't mean it, but like we all have to feel that, you know? So, um, I think just being prepared, those are really you know, that's how you overcome these barriers because they're everywhere. Mm -hmm. They really are. How about for you, Christina? What do you think are the most common barriers um, to music school? I mean, I, I can't stress enough how much I relate to Precious and that advocacy is, is going to be the number one thing that uh, when you're in music school, you absolutely have to do. You don't have a choice. Um, you have the DRC and your counselors to help you, but in, in the end, it's your fight. And it sometimes really is an uphill fight. 
Um, in my perspective, I, I think I 100% agree with her as well that the biggest barrier in music school, especially in the classical world. So the classical world is often taught by very traditional thinkers who do things in a very traditional way, um, who have done things the same way for, you know, it's hundreds of years. Western music education has remained the same generally for, you know, quite a while. Um, I remember two weeks before my, my junior recital at, in Portland, um, I was playing this duo piece with a very amazing violinist named Viet. And we asked if um, the head of the strings department would, you know, listen in on us and, and give us feedback. And uh, he did. He listened in and he was like, wow, Christina, you know, that that sounds really good. And so I made the joke. I was like, well, you know, you sound impressed. And he was like, well, truthfully, I was going to kick you out of the program because, you know, I just didn't think that it was going to work. And I was like, Oh, two weeks before my recital. That is helpful to tell me. Very helpful. Thank you. Um, and actually, he he ended up not, he barred me from the chamber music program because he didn't think that a blind student could be in the chamber music program. And it was one of those things that at the time, you know, it, you, you experience these things and you will experience them. I mean, sometimes it's unintentional um, and teachers don't mean to make things like that. And sometimes it's very intentional because they just think a certain way and they cannot see around that. And it's your job as a student, the way to get around that barrier is one of two ways. Either you advocate as much as you can for yourself and you push for that or you work around it. So in that case, I worked around it. I found chamber groups outside of the program. I, I, I made friends and we played instead. And then when I came to Lamont, they were like, oh my gosh, be in as many chamber groups as you want. This is great. Please. We always need violas. So I'm, I'm in multiple chamber groups. I'm in two or three at a time. Um, so yeah, the biggest barrier sometimes is just really getting around perspectives that are old school thinking and closed off and just don't fully understand. Um, and like I said, there are multiple different ways to approach it and everybody's their own and every situation is different too. Um, other than that, you know, ev everything else was pretty, pretty easy to break down. You know, a lot of, a lot of teachers really do want to help. And a lot of teachers, uh, really, really do want to be a support system for you and they want to see you succeed. You know, they're, they're not into teaching just to watch someone fail. They, they really want to see people succeed. So advocacy and, um, sometimes just having a really thick skin and pushing through it is, is the best way to get around those barriers. <laughs> I definitely agree with that. You, it, it's almost required that we have a thick skin because otherwise, um, you know, it, it would get us down and then we just stay down, you know, um, it's, it's, it has a lot to do with resilience, you know what I mean? Oh, um, in these situations. So she, I'm going to change the question slightly for you because you were a student, but you're currently, uh, working at a school. So as you hear about these common barriers, and I'm sure that you hear about them all the time in your assistive music tech class, um, what are some of the workarounds that you recommend to students? And also, uh, are you, you know, are you able to talk to other professors to kind of, um, help them to like change their attitudes or, or I don't know if you've ever been in, put in that kind of a, um, a situation where you were able to have a conversation like that. And, and how did it go if you were? Yeah, I mean, I, I want to just, you know, go back to my first comment is <laughs> way, way back is like, you know, attitude barrier from attitude is uh, much harder than the attitude uh, barrier from something else. And I think a lot of times when those kind of happen, you know, you have to negotiate with a uh, different faculty and how we can, you know, help students. But, you know, if this professor doesn't want to help that's puts a creates a very difficult situation and and that's uh, i don't really <laughs> deal with a, a lot of attitudes problem and if that actually happens then uh, i let the disability office deal with uh, attitudes barriers but you know i show them you know hey th there are ways you can accommodate you need to do x y and z and show them like it's not as hard as they think it is and i think a lot of those things come from lack of understanding what you know people with a disability can do and those perceptions come from what they have seen on tvs and read books and those kind of 
you know, how we are portrayed as people with a disability are, are very negative. Um, I mean, even though there are some pushes out there ch- trying to change that, but they've been getting those those negative messages everywhere from media. And I think it's, it's as a you know, sighted person, that's all they saw. You never interact with the person with a disability before then your belief system is, you know, totally, oh, uh, I guess flawed because <laughs> you never had an experience with uh, someone who's blind or something. But you no, know, that's our, now again, that's our job to advocate for ourselves and trying to change those attitude barriers. But I think it will be really important if anyone listening to this in the media or some other capacity that could influence um, perception of people with a disability. I think that's a huge job for um, those people, I think. I 100% agree with that. And my final question for you all, and I love ending with this question, is on a scale of one to 10, how accessible is music school right now? And then how accessible does it have the potential to become in you know, the foreseeable future, say like the next five to 10 years. Um, Precious, we're going to start with you. So how accessible is it, is it now? And then for the, you know, in the near future, how accessible can it become with, you know, say minor changes or even, you know, large changes? Yeah, so this one's a tough one because, you know, when I think of accessibility, not only do I think about blind students, but I think about students with other disabilities and students dealing with other things that, um, you know, there are barriers for that I've heard about that, you know, I've interacted with. Um, so I'd say, you know, solid six, six and a half to seven um, right now, because there are aspects that are accessible and there are workarounds. And, you know, if you're an advocate and if you know what you need, then you can get through it. But I think across the board, it has the potential to be a nine or higher because if everybody took notes on <laughs> Christina's course and what she's ha- she has to offer, um, like everybody would be so much better off because institutions would be more prepared, students would be more prepared, um, and you know have less stress because it's enough to be stressed out by college in general, and then to also have to have the weight of advocacy and accessibility to deal with on top of that is a lot for anyone. So. Um, you know, I really think that if, if people really listened and really took the time to, um, make these changes that are really not difficult to implement, then I think, um, it could be higher than that for sure. Mm. And how about you, Christina? Uh, I would say that music school currently as a whole, not focusing on like one specific school is somewhere between, I would say like a three or a four for me. Um, Accessibility for some reason is still considered a niche as opposed to a right, which I I still have a hard time understanding why that is. Um, And there's still a lot of times when, um, be it a blind student or a deaf student or someone with another um, documented disability needs to let's say do a course substitution or something and and they 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 reach a barrier where it's like well but this is what everyone takes well I don't think sight singing is really the right you know or sight reading is really the right class for me uh seeing as I can't see it and I'm just going to be memorizing the tunes so there's still a lot of work that needs to be done it needs to be understood that you know accessibility is a right it's it's not a privilege it's not a niche it's not something that you know oh, these, you know, three blind musicians are just gonna, you know, that they're it, that's it. You know, there's thousands of us around the world who are singers and musicians of all sorts and educators. And um, it's not a niche. We are our own community. And it's, it's something that needs to be more prevalent. So right now it's a three or four, but I easily think, you know, as Precious said, if people just open up to the resources, they open their minds a little bit and they just accept that, you know, there are some changes that need to be made and that's okay. We could easily be a nine or a 10. Everybody could easily have, you know, a braille music dictionary in their music library and could have um, the flow tools and uh, dancing dots on a computer that's accessible to a music student and could have, 
a subscription to the Library of Congress if someone uses Braille scores and could have refreshable Braille displays that can be checked out. All of this stuff is, is accessible and they'll changing language, you know, saying specifics as opposed to using non-specific like here or this or that. It's, it's just a learning curve. And if everybody embraces it, we could easily get there. Mm-hmm. And how about you, Shi? How accessible is it now and how accessible can it become? Okay, so I mean, this will be just educated. Yes, I don't. I of course, don't know of every, course. Every school <laughs> in the in the country, um, how the state of the their uh, accessibility. But you know, from stories that I hear from other students and other faculty from other university asking for help, kind of things, and I, I'll think I'll go with the Krishna three or four. I think there are a lot of uh, lack of awareness and lack of education around how to educate uh, people with a disability. Um, and I think we have a lot more to go and I think we can definitely go there, but it will require a lot of more work to do. Mm. I, I kind of feel bad that we ended on that question because <laughs> the numbers are really low. Um, so <laughs> but it's okay. It's it's the truth. Um, and this is something that students need to know going into music school. Um, but I do feel like we were able to educate our listeners on the tools that are out there so that they are armed with uh, resources uh, that they can use and that they can um recommend to their school so that, you know, things can become more accessible. And, um, you know, as they're going through their daily lives, you all were able to give some insight into things that they might face and, and um, things that they can do to work around that. So thank you all uh, for being here today. And to each of our listeners uh, who joined us, thank you. Uh, I hope that you've enjoyed another episode of Scene Change. I'm Caitlin McIntyre, President of the National Federation of the Blind Performing Arts Division. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Scene Change. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and visit our website at nfb-pad.org. There you'll find links to our social media, membership, and resources for blind performers. Thanks to everyone who makes this show happen. Scene Change is produced by Shane Lowe, Joe Schooneman, Precious Perez, Chris Nussbaum, Sayun Choi, and Aaron Jordan. With music by Ryan Strunk and Tom Page. Remember, you can be the performer you want. Blindness is not what holds you back. We'll see you next time. <laughs>